Hello, welcome once again to Virtual Church. It's Thursday the 4th of March. Lovely to have you with us. I've brought an old friend along. Those of you who've been with Virtual Church for a while might remember Alice. And look, she's starting to bring out new flowers, just one or two. If we look about, just peeping out from under there. And that's because we had to be pruned, didn't we, Alice? We had to have some cutting back so that you would be able to flourish and bear flowers once again. And maybe that's got some relevance to our studies at the moment. We're thinking about the temptations of Jesus. Was that a pruning time when he went through loneliness and hunger deprivation, thirst in the desert, because he couldn't have been our Messiah, our Redeemer, could he, if he hadn't understood what it's like to go through the things that we go through and to feel the way we sometimes feel on our journey in the wilderness, our pilgrimage. So there's Jesus in the desert uh, being tempted. We've seen him go through his first temptation. He fasted for 40 days. Afterwards, he was hungry, says the scripture, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus responds to that temptation by quoting scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone. Deuteronomy chapter 8. So... The devil's going, ah, scripture, eh? I'm sure I can find some scriptures that will make life a bit awkward. Let's see what googlies I can bowl Jesus' way. And so that's the second temptation. Here we go from Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 to 7. Then the devil took Jesus to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. We don't know if this was a real physical occurrence or in some sort of a vision or dream. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it's written, he'll command his angels concerning you. They'll lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him. It's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So what's going on here? Uh, is it uh, the sort of jewel of the scriptures? Uh, Jesus and the devil finding proof text to bat at each other. You sometimes hear people say, oh, the devil can quote scripture, you know, normally because they actually don't want to hear anything that the scripture might have to say to them. Uh, but yes, the devil can quote scripture. So is there an issue here about how do we interpret scripture. Can we cut out little snippets from the scripture and use them as what are called proof texts? And I'm going to argue today that we need to look at scripture in a more holistic way to understand what it's saying to us and then to interpret individual texts in the light of those things. So the part of scripture that the enemy is quoting to Jesus, trying to trip him up really, trying to get him to say, well, if you're the son of God, what makes you so sure? Undermining his faith. You see, God has just said, this is my beloved son, just before the temptations at his baptism. And it's straight after that Jesus goes off to be tempted. You are my son. Satan's already saying, well, if you're the Son of God, how do you know? Prove it. This is the testing part. Do something that will force God's hand, or force him to show that he loves you, and whether it's true or not. Do you see this temptation to, to look as if you're stepping out in faith? is actually a temptation to do something a bit mad, very mad, actually, if... Uh, to try and prove God, to make him do what you want him to do. 
It doesn't come from faith at all, but something else. So what is the scripture that the enemy is quoting? Well, it's Psalm 91, a very beautiful psalm that starts, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. It goes on to talk about God covering us with his feathers. Under his wings you'll find refuge. If you remember when we were looking at Stanley Spencer pictures uh, just a few days ago at the hen, taking refuge under the wings of its mother. And that's where he gets the bit. Verse 11 and 12, he'll command his angels concerning you. They'll lift you up. You won't strike your foot against a stone. So haven't you got the authority of scripture to leap off the temple? In fact, this is very relevant to us today because some churches, not very many, one or two, uh, who practice what I call believism, uh, I, will, I will come back to that in a minute, have quoted this psalm to say, let's not bother about the pandemic. And as a result, hundreds of them have got COVID. So this is the bit in Psalm 91, the same psalm, that says, you won't fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it won't come near you. Well, surely God's telling us that we don't have to worry about the pandemic. And they've had meetings, hundreds and hundreds of people are hugging and, and singing at the top of their voices and doing all those things that we've avoided doing because it isn't safe. And I've heard them on YouTube quoting that and saying, don't worry, we are immune against COVID. I'd like to suggest to you that they um, are following the advice of the enemy. Don't worry about jumping off the temple, taking a shortcut route to glory, doing something spectacular that will make everyone turn to you and follow you. And then you won't need to go to the cross and have all that horrible uh, stuff happen to you for which this wilderness temptation and testing uh, is just a prequel. Well, Jesus characterized that as putting God to the test, to doing something mad in the name of faith. But it's not faith, it's believism. It's saying, I can use my faith to make God do what I want God to do. I think Jesus is saying, that we should use our faith to trust God so that God can do in our lives what he wants to do. And that might involve a journey with no shortcuts, a journey that leads through a wilderness or even to a cross. I'm not trying to reject uh, Psalm 91. In fact, some people I love very much once blessed me and when I was going on a journey, by saying, may all the blessings of Psalm 91 go with you. I think it applies to certain seasons of life. It's conditional. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I think it's certainly talking about uh, spiritual as well as physical blessings. That no matter what circumstances we go through, we can know in the middle of them, that we're God's children. If you're the son of God, well, I know I'm his child because Jesus loved me and he died for me on the cross to bring me into God's family. I'm his son, I'm his daughter because he's shown his love in this way. And I certainly think in Psalm 91, there is a picture of the end of our journey when we fully take up our place in the shelter of God's wings 
when all the trouble and the evil of this world is over and we're at last in the house of the Lord with a table spread for us and a cup that is running over. So yes, I think it's a wonderfully meaningful psalm uh, and one that can inspire us and give us courage uh, through difficult times. But when Jesus repl replies to this quotation, this snippet out of the psalm, he turns to Deuteronomy, the same book that he quoted when he said, man shall not live by bread alone. This time he's gone to chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. It's, in fact, 6.16, it's just a few verses after the great command, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and 4. This is a normative text for all Jewish studies. It's the very heart of their understanding of their faith. It's from the Torah, the five books of the law associated so strongly with Moses, uh, which provided guidance for the whole of Israel. It's, it's part of that book in which Moses is summarizing everything that the people of Israel learned on their journey through the wilderness. And they learned almost everything there. That's where God gave them the law on Mount Sinai. That's where he gave them manna when they were hungry, where he gave them water when they were thirsty, when he led them by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. And eventually, uh, when they were ready and had learned everything that he wanted them to learn, uh, he brings them into the promised land. And Jesus, we saw last time, was looking to Deuteronomy because his own 40 days in the wilderness mirror the 40 years of God's people wandering in the desert and learning from God along their way. So this is a bit of scripture that sets the tone for our understanding of the whole of scripture. Uh, in the same way Christians would want to look to the scriptures that talk about how Jesus died for us, how he rose again from the dead, how he sent his Holy Spirit, uh, how he wants us to love God with all our heart, to love our neighbour. These are the normative parts of Scripture. And when we find difficult parts of Scripture, then we need to understand them in the light of the broad spread of the whole of Scripture and what it has to say, say to us about God's love for us and his plans for our lives. So someone comes up to you and tries to persuade you to do something you are not comfortable with and quotes some proof text, maybe from one of the obscure parts of the Bible, and says, you should do what I'm telling you to do because it says X in this verse. Step back. And... Think to yourself, what does the whole counsel of Scripture have to say to me? Don't just jump off that particular pinnacle because of a quote taken out of context. Look at the whole of God's love letter to you in the Holy Scriptures and try to understand how we need to live in the context of all of it. I think it's time to pray now. Dear Lord, thank you that when we go through hard times, when it's lonely, when we're under pressure, when we're deprived of good things that we used to, when we wonder, where is God in all this for me? 
Thank you that you get it. Thank you that you understand. Because you yourself were suffered, suffered and you were tempted. And you experienced what we experience. Thank you that we have a great high priest who sympathizes with our weakness in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So our next virtual church uh, on Saturday, the 6th of March. I look forward to seeing you then. And until then, the Lord be your shelter and your strong tower.